Hello, everybody. Welcome to Adobe Live. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Benjamin Ward. Um, I am a product manager on the Lightroom team. Um, normally, that's all that I say about myself when I'm a host on Adobe Live, but I feel like I need to um, justify my shaved head for anybody who's joined before and seen me. I usually have hair on my head. This is just an homage to a colleague of mine who's retiring today. So uh, we all kind of dressed like him in our last team meeting this morning and uh, I shaved my head to match his bald head. So that really is enough about me now and who we're really here uh, to see is photographer Nathaniel Dodson. Super excited to have him here with us today. Um, couple quick uh, announcements before I turn things over to Nathaniel. Um, if you are watching us uh, live on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Um, that is awesome, uh, but I would like to encourage you to go over to Behance and join us there. And the advantage of that is that on Behance, we have a chat pod uh, and you can submit your questions if you have any for Nathaniel um, in the chat pod. Uh, and I will relay your questions um, to Nathaniel uh, throughout his presentation so that he can answer those. Um, and I have, a, I have another little screen down here. I got my iPad down here on the left where I'm looking at the chat. So if you see me looking down here like this, uh, it's not because I've lost interest in the presentation. Um, I'm monitoring the chat um, so that I can see what folks are saying. And uh, yes, there's Cody. Hi, Cody. Yep, I got a haircut. Um, <laughs> and uh, who else do we have here? Uh, P. Stiller, hello. Uh, Viola, Steve, uh, Sean, hi, guys. Thank you for joining us so much. Hi, everybody. Um, really great to have people here. Um, so again, uh, submit your questions there uh, in the chat pod um, if, uh, if you have anything you'd like to ask uh, Nathaniel, and you can just say hello in there as well. Um, also want to say, uh, be sure that you check out our new set of Photoshop daily creative challenges with Paul Tranny. That is every weekday at 9 a.m. Pacific. Don't miss out on this new set of challenges. Super cool. Um, okay, I think we're about ready to turn it over here. So uh, Nathaniel is going to be talking to us today um, about portrait retouching um, and a lot of cool stuff that you can do with your photography in Photoshop. I don't think I'll say any more than that. I'd like to turn it over to Nathaniel. Nathaniel, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you'll be covering today? Yeah, so uh, welcome in, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Dodson. Some of you may have uh, seen some of my videos on YouTube uh, and my website, tutvid.com, and uh, I make stuff on Photoshop and Illustrator, stuff for photographers and designers and videographers and people that just like doing creative stuff. And, and Adobe happens to be the company that makes all the best stuff to do all the cool creative stuff that we all love to do. So I make Photoshop tutorials and other stuff. Um, so that's where you've probably seen me before. Um, things are a little bit of a mess right now because uh, video uploads have slowed down on the channel, but they're coming back. Don't worry. And my website's a mess right now because we've been dealing with some issues for the last couple of weeks. And to top it all off, my Instagram and Facebook are also gone because a few days ago they got hacked and Facebook, I think, has put the final nail in the coffin. The kibosh has been put on them and I may or may not have to rebuild my Facebook and Instagram feeds. So I'm not too thrilled about that. But uh, I'm here, but I'm also kind of not here. So it's kind of everything feels a little weird and disjointed, but I'm a commercial photographer and a guy that makes uh, videos about uh, photography and design and all this cool stuff using Illustrator and Photoshop. And today we're going to be doing all kinds of stuff for photographers. We're going to be using Photoshop because Photoshop's amazing. It's one of my favorite, uh, favorite things to do is play around in Photoshop. Uh, and what I've got here on the screen in front of us today, if my Wacom uh, tablet doesn't interject here, is uh, just a couple of examples of work. Um, we're going to be talking about how I do the retouching I do and going over just my approach to this stuff in general. Um, so my style ranges from sort of this bright, colorful style, very sun-kissed look to stuff that's much darker and moodier. Uh, which is the stuff that I really, really like doing this kind of stuff down here. And some of these images are straight out of camera. Some of them are composites. Um, and some of them that might look like they're composites actually aren't composites. And some images that uh, look like they're straight out of camera have been adjusted. So there's a mixture of stuff in here that is composite and stuff that is just on location photos. Um, and it's just a bunch of fun. And we're going to have fun today playing around with uh, different techniques and, and things that I do in Photoshop in order to achieve some of these looks. Now, 
disclaimer going into this. Um, we're going to be using a lot of stuff from Adobe Stock. We're also going to be playing with images that are mine, um, particularly from this shoot here with this guy today. Um, when you're the photographer and you're working on a project that you know is going to, let's say, be used for a composite, you have control over the light and a lot of times control over the location. So there's a little bit that you can do in terms of saying, okay, we know the final scene is going to have a lot of orange. We know that there's going to be heavy light coming in from the sides. We know that maybe there's going to be a backlight hitting the person in the back of the head. So you can light your shot in order to begin uh, preparing the subject for the composite image into which you're going to put them later. Um, so that's not always the case when you're working with stock photography. So that's where Photoshop really comes in and really helps us. Now, it never looks as good as when you can control it just straight out of camera and get it all right with lights and then add Photoshop to that. Then you get something that just looks incredibly awesome. And a lot of times, if you can really nail the color and light and tone and everything, you can almost take an image that doesn't even look like a composite, but just looks super epic and nobody can really tell why. And part of the reason usually is because um, you've, you've created a photo that is so out of the norm and so different from what people would normally see um, that it's striking and it, it's memorable and, and a lot of the things that you probably want your images to be. So that's that's part of what we're going to be going over today, but we will be using a lot of Adobe stock stuff, um, which kind of makes it more fun, if I'm being honest, because A, uh, it's all stuff you guys can get access to if you want, and uh, it forces us to be a little bit more creative. And that's what this is all about, right? Like, let's use these tools, be as creative as possible, have a bunch of fun, just explore these ideas and, and shape them and mold them with our hands and just play with them. And that's gonna be my general attitude going through this today. I'm gonna cover all sorts of different things. We're gonna bounce around all kinds of different ideas. Um, I really don't have anything too structured at all because we're gonna be here for like two hours. So structured two hours, like you can go to a college classroom if you want structured two hours. This. I want this to be fun and free flowing. I want to enter that photographer and design uh, flow space and have a little bit of uh, uh, bobbing and weaving here. So with that out of the way, what I am going to do is I'm going to close this. And by the way, tutvid.com, that's my uh, tutorial website. Uh, and nathanjosephdodson.com, that's my uh, photography website, my little personal blog uh, website. So I'm going to close and, this to get it out been, of the way. You've been getting some shout outs here in the chat as well. Okay. Uh, just okay. so you know, shout outs and hello, people who watch your videos. Very cool. Uh, people who've passed your videos uh, on to other folks because they found them helpful. So it's the best, man. I appreciate yeah. it so much. Uh, it's, it's, you know, as a kid, you know, 15, 16 years old, I was just sitting in my bedroom like, why can't I find the Photoshop tutorials I want? I'm going to make the ones that I want. And I was horrible at Photoshop when I go back and look at what I did. Um, yikes. That's all I can say. Um, all right. I am going to uh, let's begin here by taking a look at this photo. Uh, what I was saying was I am going to begin looking at this photo. Uh, this photo is uh, an image that was shot uh, of this guy. This is the image right out of camera, just like this. Um, I shot it on a Canon 5D Mark II, maybe like five or six years ago. And a pretty simple image. It's something that if you have an okay camera with a decent lens, you, there's no reason why you can't go out and create an image that's very similar to this. Uh, and let me explain to you what we've got going on here. So let me pull my Wacom tablet over here where my, my short arms can reach it. Uh, what we've got going on here is a brush that's far too large. Something like that probably works. What we have here is light coming from this direction, right? You can obviously see it hitting his face. It was late in the afternoon when we shot this photo and the light that's filling in this side of his face here, right? Up to that side of his nose is the sun, right? We had a great sunset. And part of why this light doesn't look absolutely awful is because the sun was very low in the sky. So the sun was really like getting ready to set. It was probably about here in the sky. Um, so it was not the bright noonday sun. We were really approaching that golden hour, that hour before the sun sets, and then the 20 minutes or so that you have of light after the sun sets. It's very difficult to work with it because it's changing literally by the minute. It's changing. It's getting darker. The angle of light is adjusting. So you got to work fast and you have to kind of have your stuff set up. And it takes a lot of practice. Once you kind of get it down, you sort of understand it a little bit better. Uh, and you're able to work with it a little bit uh, faster. So we had this shot. 
uh, lit by the sun. And then obviously you can see there's some light here on this side of his face as well. And this could have been anything. I mean, there could have been right here out of frame, a big white wall, right? Like a big uh, cinder block wall, maybe the side of a building painted white. That would work to fill this in. I believe this day, uh, it was like a chain link fence over here. We were sort of in this industrial park area uh, of South Philadelphia. And uh, we just had like a big white card set up over here. So uh, just a big old, big old whiteboard. The sun was coming through. And then we just had this fill light bouncing back to this side of his face. You could use a fill card if you're more comfortable with flash photography. You could set up a flash with a big soft box and just, you know, fill some light in. My whole point in showing you this is this photo is not some crazy elaborate lighting setup. Um, it's not the best light. Right. I mean, it was five years ago. I've changed a lot as a photographer, um, but I thought it was a good example for this because it's very simple light. It isn't the best light. It isn't the best job I've ever done. But the way that I worked with this image very much conveys the thought process that I have when I'm working with a photo like this. Um, and obviously this is not a composite. This was out on location. Um, so the first thing that we normally do is go through and we clean up blemishes. So we clean up stuff on the skin and whatever your philosophy is about how much you want to retouch skin. Some people like to just nuke everything and everything has got to go. Uh, other people and myself included, I tend to be the kind of person that's like, if the client requests something specific, obviously I'm going to get rid of it, whatever. I'm not going to put a six pack on your forehead, but I might make a joke that I could do it if we wanted. Um, but usually what I do, my, my baseline is like, if it's, if it's a pimple or uh, you, you nicked yourself shaving or something, something that's going to be gone in a couple of weeks, I'll usually get rid of that stuff. And then if they say, Hey, could you like get rid of these lines in my forehead? Of course we can do that. Uh, but usually I'll just clean up uh, different blemishes like that. Uh, and then big, uh, begins the process of working on the eyes. So here, if I turn on curves, you can see we just flood a little bit of light into the eyes and then here upper. And this is the one area where I kind of cringe looking at it again. It's five years ago, cut me some slack. Uh, this is not how I do catch lights uh, in the top part of eyes now. Uh, we may cover that today. Uh, and then this here, just really adding this, this sort of crystallization of light into the bottom of the eyes. Uh, and then just an overall level of sharpness. Again, I probably wouldn't do this uh, nowadays either, but I know what I was thinking at the time. Uh, it's just a little over sharpened, if I'm being honest, right? It just kind of like it makes the hairs, is uh, the five o'clock shadow, it makes those hairs look whiter. Any hair that's reflecting light all of a sudden goes from being just like a, uh, a little piece of hair that looks like it's lit up to just he's got all this white and gray hair and his facial hair all of a sudden. Uh, and then becomes uh, begins the process, I should say, of the relighting and the smoothing of light, right? If I was to re retouch this today, we would really try to smooth the transition of light across his face, right? You have very extreme lines here uh, where you've got the light here, but then you've got right a lot of light to the right of this line. And then the shadow begins very drastically. And then kind of under his eye, you have that shadow there. And then the big shadow here on his nose. And then even here, like it's kind of a drastic difference between the way the light looks here and the shadow here. So I would, I would look to just sort of smooth the transition of light. Um, and I, I didn't really do that here, uh, but that's what I would look to do today. What I did instead was I began picking out items in the background that I just used a curves adjustment layer and started lighting those up to, to bring some depth to the background, right? You can build depth into a background of any image uh, just by re-emphasizing the light, make certain things darker, make certain things brighter, or you can dodge and burn, whatever your preferred method is, uh, whether or not that's using a curves adjustment layer or levels or wh whatever your preference is. Uh, all right, so then we go ahead and begin doing some white balance and, and color grading. You can see there, we get this sort of greenish hue. I'm not quite sure how I think about it, but again, we're not looking at the finished image. And then here's where things look, start to look really crazy. If I turn these four layers on, uh, just add all these crazy flares. So again, my thought process here was right, but maybe I went a little overboard with the amount of flaring and everything like that. Um, subtlety was not necessarily a tool in my toolbox at the time. Uh, it was not something that was well used in the repertoire of things that I had uh, at my disposal. Anyway, the thought process is correct. That being, when you look at a scene, and let me find another image here to share with you guys. Uh, let's take this photo right here of this this guy sitting here, right? If you're going to if you're going to light a shot like this, 
right? Um, there's a couple things you're looking for, right? Wh whatever, he's, he's lit from the front and it is what it is. Well, add a new layer here. He's lit from the front, right? There's just a, a soft box or some kind of light, throwing some light down here, somewhat harsh light to light him up. Uh, the deep shadow works, it's a really moody photo, that's great. But what really adds an element of like cinematic depth to this image is this right here this edge light that just brings him out, right? And it's there on the side of his head. It's kind of here on the side of his jacket a little bit. It's a little more difficult to see, especially when I circle it with this big white circle. Um, but what's causing that is this light, but it's probably not really that light. In filmmaking, that light is what would be called a practical light, right? The light's just there as a prop. It looks like it's a light. Really what's lighting that up is a little light that's way up high, out of frame here, and it's got a grid on it to really contain the light and it's gelled orange to match this light. And it's just blasting a little snap of light to just whoop, right down the whole side of his body. And it looks right because this practical light has been placed in the scene. So when somebody looks at the photo, they say, yeah, it looks like there should be a little bit of orangey light coming over this guy's I mean, camera left shoulder. Okay. So this is the idea that I had back with the shot, right? That being all of this orangey flare over here is coming from the side where I knew the sun was, right? The sun's lighting him up from this right side of frame. Uh, therefore, we can add a big old flare there. It's just I overdid it, right? And then I added sort of this tealish blue uh, flare as if the light bouncing back into the camera also had some color. So I was just kind of playing on that whole cinematic teal blue in the shadows, orange yellow in the highlights idea uh, and having a little bit of fun with that. But again, maybe a little overboard. Uh, and then a couple adjustment layers here just to kind of kill off contrast and we're really going flat. Um, another thing that'll change the game in terms of your own retouching, a lot of people think you gotta go into Lightroom or Camera Raw or Photoshop and take your photos and more contrast is better, right? You gotta blow the contrast up. You gotta crank that contrast up. Part of the issue with uh, thinking like that is a lot of cameras don't have great dynamic range. So you might take a photo of like a family picnic and the sky is blown out white uh, or the, the foreground is really dark. So if you just increase the contrast, you're just going to exaggerate those issues. Unless you're shooting with an incredibly high end, like medium format camera or some of the new Nikon, Canon and Sony uh, cameras, particularly the mirrorless systems have really impressive dynamic ranges, still not like the big medium format cameras have, but you know, we don't all have tens of thousands of dollars to drop on a big medium format camera. So you can sort of fake this higher dynamic range by first reducing the contrast and we're in Photoshop, man. So you can just add contrast back, but where you want and how you want it. So this is exactly what we do here. We, we take this super low contrast version of this image and I just merge it up to a new layer, right? So I just like, boom, merge it to a new layer and I desaturate it as well. So I would have gone image adjustments, uh, desaturate, or usually I use like a black and white adjustment layer and just merge the layers together because it's just a better black and white image, but whatever. The point stands, you make it black and white, and then you can start playing with your layer styles. Now here I went with multiply, uh, but you can always try something like soft light overlay. These are uh, blend modes that are introducing contrast back into the image. But in this case, I knew, yeah, I want some contrast, but I also want to kind of bring down this extreme brightness that I've got going on. And look at what happens. Just one multiply um, finishing layer, if you will, on top of everything and totally changes the way the image looks. Uh, and then just comes the process of a bunch of adjustment layers where we're playing with the color and the tone and how do we want the light to look? How do we, how deep do we want the shadows to go? Do we want to desaturate more or, or what have you? Uh, and then a dodge and burn layer. Again, probably went a little heavy on the dodge and burn. Uh, a few more adjustment layers. Again, just subtle tone adjustments and then just some final sharpening. Uh, and again, went overboard with the sharpening just overall in this image again if i zoom in on his hair you can see how you really don't want to have hairs that start to look like speckles of white um but you know you live and you learn these things and and uh you know five years is a lot of time especially in the te technological field but um as a as a, an artist in my mid-20s going to an artist who's 30 31 years old you know you'll learn a lot you change a lot so this is the kind of stuff we're going to cover today we're also going to work with some composite stuff um so let's get started with this 
and uh, we're just gonna have some fun with it. I am going to close this, I think, and I am going to close this as well. And let's go pick out an image uh, to composite. So I've just got a bunch of images here that I uh, threw together. I guess one of the first things we can do is we can begin building a background scene and then we can choose a subject to put into that scene and I'll show you how to blend it all together. And we'll kind of, uh, we'll do something like that and we'll have some fun with that. So let's go with kind of this, uh, you know, seedy looking hotel. Uh, here we go. And this, you know, things maybe aren't going so great in your life if you're pulling into a hotel like this or like me, you're one of eight kids and you've been on a two, three week family vacation and the money's running a little low. So your parents end up staying at hotels like this. Um, anyway, cool little hotel. And we're going to take this scene and begin preparing it for uh, the background of a composite. Uh, one of the things that you want to do when you're working with a composite, generally speaking, and I should probably open up my, uh, my images again here. Where did I put that? It's probably on my desk. I'll, I'll just interject really quickly to say um, yep. uh, thanks from P. Stiller. Uh, thanking you for the breakdown uh, there. I think that's what that comment was uh, directed at, The what you all just showed us in that previous photo. Um, and then also no questions yet, but okay. um, the entire um, chat community here um, is apparently banding together to form a Photoshopaholics anonymous support group. Um, so <laughs> everybody's really into what we're doing here today. I think. That's, uh, that's good. That's good. Um, all right. So this photo here, this is a this is definitely a pretty obvious composite, I would say, um, and and not the best composite, if I'm being honest and and critical of my own work, um, because. Really, when I shot this photo, this guy had flown in from, I believe it was Florida, and we had like an hour, hour and a half with him, and we had to get some other press photos. And then it was like, hey, we were out at this location in the middle of the city, and it was like, hey, can we set up and do some photos that we could build composite images with? And like, I say yes to everything, which is really stupid, um, but I said yes to it. And then I was like, all right, well, let's throw together something that we could make, figure out a way to work with later. So what I did was I just did three lights, basically one light lighting up this side of his head from behind, one light lighting up the other side of his head, also behind him, just kicking these nice, just little edge lights across his cheeks, and then a light in the front, just throwing some light into his face. Uh, this edge light here on the right side of his face, we really don't need, probably don't even want based on the way our background looks, right? All of our light is coming from the left side of the frame. So all the, the motivation of the light should all be moving left to right. We really don't need anything over there on the right side as if there's additional light coming in from the right uh, and hitting him in that side of the, uh, in that side of his head. Um, but however, this image, uh, this was, a, 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 a Hey, here we are in the topic of little, uh, questionable looking motels. Uh, this was in, uh, Atlantic city, I believe this little hotel, I was just down there one day, you know, shooting photos and whatnot, but this is a, a picture. Uh, I was standing like on the beach, kind of like on the beach side, the ocean was to my back and I was shooting back toward Atlantic city and Atlantic city. Um, not the nicest looking place, if I'm being honest. Uh, so I didn't really want whatever heaps of trash and uh, maybe a broken down car and a chain link fence, probably something under construction uh, down here at the far end of this hotel. However, I thought it was looking really cool with the taxi out in front of it. And this like it's got that green AstroTurf stuff they had all over their their little step up to, to get to the windows and doors. So it was kind of neat looking and I like the character of the place. So what I did was I shot this photo and then I turned around and took a picture of uh, the casinos in the distance up the beach. So this stuff here, the little shed, all this grass and the beach, this was actually behind me if I turned around behind. And I just came into Photoshop and I cut the entire sky away. I dropped this photo in behind it. And then because this is where the light was coming from, I put an artificial sun glow and all this fog and everything to kind of obscure some of those buildings off in the distance over there. Uh, but this, lo this looked like a very kind of nah, not great photo when I first took it. Uh, and you can totally change the mood and the everything about the image when you simplify, when you get rid of the stuff you don't want, and you work with the light that's in the image, and you can build incredible scenes. I mean, you, this is very simple compared to uh, some of the stuff. I mean, the look around Behance, people do incredible stuff um, that, that takes a lot of time and patience and effort and things like that. But the principle is just simplify, match color, match light, and stuff works. 
right? Like you never take a can of Coke and put it down on your desk and think, hmm, that looks like I just Photoshopped that into place because it works. And it works because the light matches, the saturation matches, the brightness matches, uh, the color tone, everything about it matches, the direction of light matches, of course, because you're taking a physical object and putting it into your physical environment. So if you can just do that same stuff in Photoshop, your stuff is going to just, it's going to work. I don't know how else to put it. It's just going to work. Um, so, so the, the key thing about this image that I wanted to point out was simplify, simplify, simplify. It's never bad to simplify. I got rid of air conditioning units that were on the roof. I got rid of the clouds in the sky. I got rid of all the junk in the background and I just simplified it, cleaned up the road by just retouching it. Um, which is something that, you know, I'll try to explain that to your family. You're retouching roads for a living. So what we want to do with this is, the hotel's cool. It's got this sweet neon uh, thing going on. The doors are all different colors. The parking lot looks grungy and gritty, uh, but the the top half of the images uh, leaves a little bit to be desired in terms of what we want to do. And hey, look, we've got one of our, our friends over here, uh, a trusty AC unit up on the roof. So we want to go ahead and get rid of all this stuff. Now, a couple of things. I could take this opportunity to show you kind of a cool newer feature in Photoshop, and that is the edit sky replacement. Um, and what Photoshop is going to do is through the power of its artificial intelligence, it's going to say, hey, let's find the sky in this image, and it will replace that sky uh, just like that. And uh, there's all sorts of different skies and clouds and stuff that you can choose. Uh, and it usually does a pretty good job. I mean, you can see the trees are pretty much intact. Um, you know, it's, it's missing some stuff in there. But hey, man, it, we're early on in this artificial intelligence stuff. And uh, it's it's pretty incredible that in just a few seconds, you can do this much. Still not quite uh, where I want it to be for my own photography purposes, but it's always worth a try because sometimes it'll blow your socks off. We're not going to use that here um, because we're just going to follow the roof line. And we've been blessed with a fairly straight roof line. So uh, what I'm going to do is grab the pen tool. And we're just going to create a path and we'll save the path. We'll be able to use that as our selection. Now, I'm going to kind of bite into the red roof when I make this selection, because as you can see with this image, the roof is a little blurry, a little noisy. Those are other things we need to keep in mind when we're replacing something. If we take this blurry, somewhat noisy image and we put a crystal clear, perfectly smooth sky behind it, it's just going to look off. It, it may just look a little bit off, like subconsciously, something just doesn't look right. And what's not right is it's not matching. So you need to match even that, that subtle texture. We've got noise and grain in there and we'll do our best to match that. The reason I want to bite into the roof is because there is that blurry edge and we want to be able to blur the sky to the roof. But when we blur, the blur is going to necessarily blend back upward into what would be the sky. Well, we don't want to see like this dark green tree and the blue of the sky. We just want to see more red roof as it blurs. So you just need to kind of bite off a little bit of the red roof, right? Just something like that. And then I'm gonna just slide down along here and follow the roof line as best I'm able. You see some things like this, you're gonna have to kind of go over. Um, and again, this may not be our, our cleanest cut ever, but you know what? We're gonna have a lot of fun doing it. And if it can't be my cleanest, I am determined to make it uh, the most enjoyable one I've done yet. Here we go, bing. And I just, I clicked and dragged there at the end of that one. So it gave me a little bit of curve and I don't want any curve on my pen. go through here and then you get long straight runs you take advantage of them that's not against the rules there we go and while you're doing this nate i'll just pop in to say for anybody who's joined us uh, since we started we're talking with photographer nathaniel dodson um, and he is showing us uh, some awesome techniques for photo retouching and compositing in photoshop if you have questions please do feel free to put them into the chat um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can come over to Behance and watch us live on Behance um, where the chat is and you can uh, put your questions in right there. Yeah, and, and questions are always good, guys. It makes my job a little bit easier because it's uh, kind of just like tailor-made tutorial. You're asking for it. Hopefully I can show it and uh, it just gives us something else to talk about as well. All right, so I'm just going to complete right, this uh, path. Sorry, Nate, there is a question from Carol. Um, and I think, uh, Carol, you can chime in again if I'm not getting your question exactly right, but I think Carol's asking about um, feathering that line along uh, along the roof there. Like, do you want to feather yep. that selection? Uh, is that something you're going to get to? Yep. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what we'll, we'll, we have a, a plethora of options available to us in Photoshop, as with virtually everything in Photoshop, there's 50 different ways to do it. Um, so we'll, we'll explore and see what looks best. Um, you can just, you can feather your mask, you can feather selection, we can go and blur it uh, as needed later on. Uh, so it, it, a hundred percent will be blurred or feathered in some capacity. Um, again, just because we really want to match that edge nicely. So we'll come over here to paths and we have this work path. You can just double click it and we can name it whatever sky doesn't really matter. And it's just going to save that selection for us. So uh, now we can uh, do anything we want here. We can, we can choose to bring in a sky image. I don't know if I saved the sky image uh, because I plan ahead really well. Um, but if I didn't, that's totally fine. I do have this kind of colorful sky. Maybe we'll play with that. I don't think it's going to work for what we want. Uh, you can always just use a gradient. Um, I am going to, yeah, I'm just going to open this in Photoshop just so we have it sitting there. And we'll, we'll fuss with it later if we decide to fuss with it. Um, okay, so uh, you know what? The time to fuss with it is now. What am I thinking? I'm going to just drag this image over and drop it in place here. And we got this big old image. Now, this isn't quite going to look right because, again, if you look at the sky image, this is a sky that was shot from very far away with a very wide angle lens. The clouds are very small and uh, it's it's really a sky that's more suited to a vast, expansive landscape shot, not sort of a, a 35 millimeter esque tight shot of a, a little hotel parking lot. That being said, there's things we can do because again, it's Photoshop and we have options. Uh, we can hold down shift. We could stretch the sky this way, which immediately is going to change the perspective of the clouds. Right now, it, it, it makes everything look like it's a lot closer to us. And all we've done is stretched it top to bottom a little bit. So that makes a big difference. Um, you can work to hide the horizon, right? Your eyes just know that as you get closer to the horizon and the sun is low in the sky, uh, the light is cutting through more atmospheric haze and all that other sciencey stuff that I'm, I'm not good at. Uh, and you get more color and reflections and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so you, you naturally are expecting to see this orange and green and yellow and all these different colors much closer to the horizon. So if we can kind of hide that behind the hotels, great. Uh, and the other thing we can do is just hold down our alter option key and just straight up scale it up larger. And just, we just want bigger clouds up there, right? But again, part of the issue that you, you really aren't gonna be able to escape is the fact that this clouds photo was taken like straight on and the clouds we expect to see from this parking lot angle are like more up like this, right? You'd be looking up to see the clouds like this. Whereas if you're standing on some big plateau over the, the badlands of South Dakota, you're looking out and the sky is just up there and it's, it's big and it's in front and it's up and it's to the sides and it's everywhere. We're still going to see what we can get here. So we'll command or control click uh, on this uh, sky path thumbnail. It's going to load it as a selection. And we have our sky here. We can just name it if we want. And we can hit the layer mask icon to just add this as layer mask, right? It looks terribly out of place, I know. But just consider for a second. If you, if you were to go and take a 10-minute nap and come back, which don't do, wait until I'm off air. But if you were to do it... Um, this photo would not look all that out of place all of a sudden. And in one fell swoop, we have simplified a great deal of this image just by replacing the sky. The color doesn't match. The brightness doesn't match. It doesn't match. I get it. We're going to fix that stuff. We're going to try to fix it. Um, but this is a very quick way to um, change all of that, change the entire look and feel of an image. Uh, and it's very simple to do. It's just simplify. Get rid of that bag of garbage sitting over there. Get rid of that pothole in the middle of the street. You'd be surprised at how much that kind of stuff can do. All right, so now here's what I was talking about. Um, the noise of the sky is actually fairly close to the noise on the roof. Again, I don't know if we're even going to stick with this, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time fussing with the noise. Um, but here, if we select the mask for the sky layer and we open up our properties panel, uh, you have this feather option right here. And we can just begin feathering and keeping an eye on the edge of the mask right? And just try to get it so it matches what we would sort of expect to see. If you go, obviously, like ridiculous, it's going to look ridiculous, right? 142 pixels for the feather is um, a little wild. We don't need that. Uh, something more like four and a half, five probably is going to blend much, much better. And all of a sudden, you just get rid of this harsh, hard edge that was all the way around the image. Quick trick, by the way, if things just look crazy and out of place, uh, throw a black and white adjustment layer over your whole image and you can very quickly tell like, okay, this side of the sky is just too dark and this side of the sky is just too bright. 
So you could then go in and add adjustment layers and mask and, and change the sky so it looked a little bit more like it should. I'm gonna keep this sky here for a second. Um, but what I want to do is I want to try creating a gradient because the end result that I'm going for here is a shot of this hotel that looks a lot more like it's nighttime. Um, so we're going to be doing some color and, and exposure adjustments as well in just a minute. Um, I am going to command or control click on the mask for the sky. Um, actually, I probably don't even need to do that. I can just duplicate the mask and then we can pull the feathering up and everything with us. Uh, let's go ahead and create a gradient adjustment layer. Uh, there are a lot or a gradient fill layer. I'm sorry. It's gradient fill layer. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can create a gradient. I mean, of course, it goes without saying you can do uh, a gradient layer. I've taken to using gradient layers because it's like technically the more non-destructive thing. And it kind of feel you feel more sophisticated when you use a gradient fill layer, if I'm being honest. Right. That's just the way I do it these days. Um, all right. So I am going to uh, let's just begin by choosing like some dark blues and purples. Very dark. Um, and we'll go, so the sky looks a little bit darker usually, right? When, you, when it's closer to the horizon and it gets a little lighter and desaturate, uh, a little little lighter and more saturated as it goes up, I think, I think, I don't know. Maybe I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here. Uh, let's go ahead and scale this down a little bit uh, to pinch the, the gradient together a little. And then we can click and drag the gradient and just drag it up toward the top, something maybe like so and we'll hit OK. And now if I just hold down Alter Option and drag that mask from the sky layer up to our gradient fill layer, Photoshop says, hey, you want to replace the layer mask? Absolutely, Photoshop, I do. And now you can see we've got this very dark sky, which doesn't look right because the now the foreground is way too bright. Um, and I think I might want to lighten up the lighter side of this blue just a little bit more. Maybe take this up to like 22, something like so. Uh, yeah, it's probably all right. And you could take the time to put, you know, very subtle clouds up there and stars and things like that. And it's all great stuff to do. Uh, but I don't I don't necessarily know that we're going to get into that here. And let's look here and we can see that the edge is blurred. I might actually want to feather it a little bit more with this darker. But I don't want to get too much. The thing is, when you start feathering it a bit more, we do see some of those artifacts of the old uh, sky and stuff. But I think it kind of works. I think it kind of works with this image. Uh, I kind of dig it. All right, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and start bringing down the exposure of this image and um, playing with the foreground a little bit more and trying to get this this whole scene to look a little bit more night-ish. Um, and maybe what we'll have to do is come in and completely replace the sky with something lighter just to get it to match. Um, so I'm going to shut the sky off for a second. We have our selection. We've got idea an idea of the masking and what's going to go on there. Uh, let's go ahead and go back down to our background layer and here with adjustments. Uh, we're going to begin using curves. Uh, now, if you're not aware of how curves works, it's it's simple, but if you don't know how it works, it's um, maybe infuriating. It's it's um, one of the most powerful tools, features, whatever you want to call it in Photoshop. It's incredible what you can do with curves. Uh, the way it works is oh, not like that. We want to bring it out here because I want to be able to see my image a little bit more. Uh, the way it works is you have the dark stuff in your image. Notice the histogram in the back here, right? And the, the dark pixels are represented by the, the spiky stuff on the left side. And the brighter pixels are over here represented by the spiky stuff on the right side of the histogram. Where the histogram spikes up, those parts of the image are particularly bright. Like I would venture to say that these bright spikes here in the light area are probably the varying shades and colors involved in that neon tube running across the ridge of the roof there. Just a guess. Um, and what I want to do is make the whole scene darker. Um, so the, the point up here is your white point. So if I bring this down, it's going to reduce the brightness of the scene, but also reduce the contrast because it's just taking the white point of the image and it's making it less white. So it's just making the whole scene darker and everything follows suit with that. And the same, by the way, you can do with the black point. If you drag it up, you make everything brighter, but less contrasty because you're taking the black, the, like the black floor and you're just lifting it right up. So if you, if you want to preserve contrast while darkening the scene, just click and drag downward along the point. And you can see you have a nice contrasty scene that's getting darker. When I say nice contrasty scene, I mean kind of mucky, grungy, gunky looking contrasty scene because it's not a nice contrast. And the same goes for if you pull upward, you brighten the scene. Okay. So I... Uh, I'm going to click and drag away to get rid of that point. You just rip the point off and, and Photoshop throws it away. 
part of uh, what happens at night as things get darker is things do look less white, right? Uh, the bright stuff does look uh, not like a, not, not something like the neon that we don't want to get darker. We'll address that in a second. Uh, but you do want to bring down the white level of your entire scene. So we do want to grab the white point and just reduce, right? Reduce, reduce, reduce. Let things become less contrasty. Um, typically at night, stuff that's not bright it looks a little bit less vibrant and colorful as, as well. So uh, we'll, we'll, adjust the saturation or vibrance of the shot uh, in addition to this. And then maybe I'll go in and I'll also make it a little bit darker here as well. And I may raise the white point a little. Um, again, just because when you when you think cinematic, you start by uh, reducing contrast and, and creating a really flat image, a flat scene uh, in which you can work. So there we go. We've, we've begun the darkening process. Uh, let's go ahead and try something else here. Let's go adjustments. Uh, let's go color lookup table and from the color lookup table drop down. Let's go with, uh, there's a couple here that could work. Drop blues might work, but I might try moonlight. And this has given us this really dark scene. Uh, we may want to try setting this to something like multiply. That's not bad. Soft delight. Let's see. Uh, not bad as well. Maybe a little too contrasty. Let's go back to multiply. Uh, and as with all these adjustment layers, you always can adjust the opacity. So I don't want it to be uh, ridiculous or anything, but I do want it to be a bit darker. So just reduce that opacity to about 50%. So if we go back and look at our original photo, this is what we started with. Here's where we are now. Eventually, we're going to add this night sky to this whole situation as well um, to really begin uh, changing things up. In fact, if I turn on the other sky, let's see how that looks because maybe this sky, if I move it down here, so it's being darkened as well, maybe these clouds would work. I mean, see, they kind of, they kind of look not so great, right? It's just, it's just too different. It's too um, uh, out of the element of this scene that we're creating to really work well. Uh, but if you can find a stock photo of uh, the night sky or some stars or whatever, again, you can take creative liberties here. It's part of the fun with uh, these composite images. Um, all right, so next up, I'm gonna come into here and we'll probably try doing some color balance stuff. Um, again, you don't you don't want to spend too much time fiddling with the colors, but we're going to go to shadows. We're going to make this, these a little bit bluer, just a little bit, just a couple ticks, and maybe a little bit of cyan as well. By the way, you could do this in the uh, in the curves adjustment layer, excuse me, uh, by playing with those color channels. Uh, but we, we we might touch on that later. I probably will, in fact. Uh, all right, so there we go. We just adjust the color a little bit. You can see it just takes away some of that dusty feeling of it and gives it more of a sharp nighttime look. Um, now that we've done this, I think this, this brings us about where we want to go. Uh, it still feels a little off to me. Let me go. We could try photo filter. Maybe the vibrance, reduce the, reduce the vibrance a little bit uh, because, again, at night, things look a little bit less colorful, right? You can, actually, that, that does a lot. That's great. Uh, you can just see how it takes it takes some of the spice out of those doors, right? And just makes it look a little bit more like you would expect it to look at night. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna bring that neon back here in just a second. Uh, I think that's probably about where we'll where we'll stop with the night with the nighttime fussing of this. Uh, and as I say that, maybe I'll try to add a cooling filter and just see what that does. Let's go cooling filter eighty. Uh, let's boost the density a little bit. Oh yeah, see I kind of like that. And if we set this to multiply and just reduce the opacity, let's see how this looks. Yeah, I kind of dig that. Just a little bit more blue. It's really going to affect the walls, give them a little bit of a darker uh, uh, vibe. All right, so we have practical lights in this scene. Um, and those practical lights are all of this neon. And also, by the way, these lights on the underside of the soffit here. Uh, those are really important that we bring that stuff back because with all of these adjustment layers, I mean, look at how awful this light looks. Give it a second. There it is. It just, it looks horrendous. It doesn't look like it's lighting anything up and the, the light still is bright, whether it's uh, kind of dusk or the middle of the night. So we need to bring those lights back and here's how we're going to do that. We're going to just select our top adjustment layer and we're going to hold down shift and select the bottommost adjustment layer and hit Control D or Control G, excuse me. That would be Command G on the Mac. It's going to group them together, and we'll call this Night Look or something like that. And I'm going to back out a little bit. And the next step is just to add a mask to this. So we're going to go ahead and add a mask. Voila. And then I'm going to come in here. I'm going to zoom in on this neon, and we're going to sort of trace the neon. But it's neon, and it has light spill. 
really, it doesn't even have to be neon. It's just light uh, that is in a dark place and it's going to spill. So you don't need to worry about being like, oh, I can only trace the little tiny line that's on the actual neon. I'm gonna bring in my Wacom tablet here so we can uh, kind of hammer through this here. Uh, what we'll do uh, is we will, at some point here, the Wacom will take and I'll be able, there we go. I'm gonna take my brush and I'm gonna right click. We wanna make this a very soft brush and we wanna make it kind of a reasonable size, maybe a hundred pixels, something like that. Because as we're uh, painting, we want to uh, bring back not only the neon, but some of the glow fall off around the neon, right? The roof will light up around the neon. Um, we want to paint with black as our foreground color. Why are we painting with black? Because all we're doing is we're hiding all of these adjustment layers that are in this night look group that we just created. So I'm going to click once and then I'm going to hold down shift and click here at the sort of apex or point of turn in that neon. And I'm gonna do that with the neon all across the image, right? You don't, you don't have to worry about it being exact. Again, we can we can feather even this, um, this mask. And by the way, this sort of fall off onto the roof, it's good to get some of that as well, but you probably don't wanna do it at 100% opacity. So I'll take my brush and I'll reduce it to like 70% opacity. When you have the brush tool selected, you can just use the numbers. So just hit the number seven and it goes to 70% opacity. And then you can just get some of that stuff there right? Just kind of like that. And then hit zero to go back to 100 and then keep clicking your way through. Voila. Make sure you fill in anything uh, underneath just so uh, it doesn't look, it looks like it hits the sort of wet roof a little bit more naturally. I totally did not know that about hitting the numbers to change your uh, opacity with the <laughs> it's brush. It's the best, man. Awesome. It's, it's the best. Thank you it's for great. that. Also, it's while I'm, while I'm talking, I'll just interject quickly. Uh, we had a comment. Oh, I lost it. Where'd it go? Oh, from Dolch, if I'm saying that right. Never had the courage to learn how curves work, but that's why we're here. That's why we're here. We have this incredible opportunity and I am clearly learning stuff as well. So this is great. Um, and again, if anybody does have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat on Behance and I will uh, relay your questions to Nate. So what I'm doing by the way here is if you don't have a tablet, you can just click once with the brush, hold down shift and click a second point and Photoshop will make a straight line right to that point. And as we get further from the camera position here, uh, the neon gets smaller. So we wanna just make the brush size a little smaller. Use your bracket keys uh, next to the letter P on your keyboard and just make your brush tool a little bit smaller. And all I'm doing here is I'm just holding down the shift key and I'm, I'm just click, 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 and just going through just like this. And we're going to just reveal all this neon and then we'll go back over it and we'll touch up the stuff, uh, the sort of the, the fall off onto the roof around the neon. But you're going to see how kind of it looks rough when you're zoomed in on it, but it, it's going to look it's going to look right when we zoom back out. Because all of a sudden uh, you, you remember that that light is light. All right, we're coming down the home stretch here. Here we go. There we have it. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger here because we got this neon plus some fall off onto the roof. And then if I zoom out, you can see that the neon looks relatively natural, especially where we uh, really added onto the roof, right? So what I'm going to do is, uh, in consideration of that, I am going to take my brush. I'm going to make it pretty big. And um, for the red, I probably don't want to go full 70. Maybe I'll go like 40. So again, just hit the number four. And then I'm just going to paint some of this color in the foreground. Voila, that's great. And uh, maybe get a little bit more of that in there. Cool. Um, we're just, it's just the light fall off from this red neon. And it would be doing this, especially when it's this dark. You really are going to see the fall off onto the roof. So it's important that you keep up with that stuff. Um, you probably want to follow it a little bit more closely than just a straight line, right? So you want to do something that's a little bit more organic here. Photoshop's jumping around on me. Give me a second. Here we go. There. And just going through and adding that light. And I'll probably make it a little smaller over here because it doesn't look like we have nearly as much fall off. And the one thing that I am going to sort of keep an eye on is up here on the top of the neon, you're not gonna have light that falls off and hits the sky, right? 
So like this kind of stuff that's sticking up out of the top, you want to be really careful to get rid of that. So I'm going to hit the number zero, go back to make sure you have 100% opacity on the brush. Uh, and we want to make sure we're painting now with white, not with black. So I'm going to hit the X key to flip foreground and background colors. We're painting with white, and that's just going to bring back that, uh, that night look series of adjustment layers and just kind of darken that stuff up. And it doesn't have to be straight and exact. Remember, neon is like that really jittery, um, very organic up and down. Uh, it, it creates all sorts of different patterns and things. So it doesn't have to be this perfectly straight line. In fact, if it's not perfectly straight, it probably looks better. There, I got rid of some of the neon. That's my mistake. I'm going to just touch that up. There we have it. And then you could go back over this being very, very careful. Um, I think we, we've kind of played with the neon enough, but you can see how we've now taken that neon. It looks natural, even though this is not at all the way it was uh, when we began the image, right? We've just darkened the whole image, but the neon still looks right because that's in neon is just doing what neon does. And that's being bright and glowing. Uh, however, we still have these other practical lights. Uh, so what I think I'll do with these is we're going to grab our brush tool. We're going to do like, uh, maybe a, we'll do 100% opacity for up here near the light, right? So something like that. Um, but I want to make some light fall off. So we'll do like 30% opacity and just do some light fall off here. Maybe a spot on the ground where the light would be hitting. Something like that. And then we have to fill it in between there so it looks proper. And let's zoom this down or size that down. Tap around the light until it brightens up. And then we'll go ahead and do a big spot here on the ground where it uh, where it's going to hit the ground. Maybe one tap, maybe two, something like that. And then just a little line of light right up to the light, just so it looks you know kind of like it probably should, sort of. Uh, and then we'll tap around the light up here. I just tap it a few times because again the brush is at this thirty percent opacity, so we need to uh, tap a couple times to bring it up. And then, so I'm tapping twice on the ground and then I'm doing one brush from the ground up to the light, just like that. And then making the brush smaller as I move, work my way down uh, away from the camera, so to speak. And I'm gonna make the brush a little bit bigger here. And we're gonna go tap, tap, and then just a line right up to that light. Cool. And then our last light over here, uh, just like this. And what we're doing is we're, we're essentially digitally relighting the scene. Um, but we, we have a lot of options here. Okay. Something like that looks good. And, and if you, when you're looking at this and you're saying, you know what, I still, uh, it doesn't look blended enough for me. It still looks a little, uh, out of the ordinary. It still doesn't quite look right. There are a lot of different things you can do, not least of which is just select the mask. And we still have this option to feather and further blur what we've got going on. So that's going to affect the neon. That's going to affect everything here. And you can see what it's doing to the neon there. Uh, maybe a little bit much for my taste. Um, but Maybe I'll push it up to uh, maybe like a 10. Let me try like a 10 pixel feather here. Let's see how this goes. Something right around there is not bad. I like what it's doing to my lights, but not quite what it's doing to the neon. So let's cut it in half to a six and something like that's cool. And then at this point, you might be looking at it and saying, okay, we're, we're starting to get sort of the scene that we want. Uh, of course, we need to worry about our sky going into place. I can turn that sky on and see how it looks. Uh, it doesn't quite look as natural as I would like it to look, um, probably because we really don't have much in the way of stars and stuff. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna fuss around with it here in just a minute. Um, but maybe the the foreground is a little bit too dark. Well, because all these adjustment layers are in this group, we can just reduce the opacity of the entire group. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna bring some of the light back into our foreground scene, which I think I do want to do. So we're still really darkening that foreground. If I shut the effect off, you'll see there's what it looked like. And now we're just really, really darkening it here by bringing that look in. So now is a time to play with the sky. And uh, I think what we'll do is go in here and we got to change these colors up. So we got to go for like a little less saturated, but maybe a little bit lighter. And then up here at the top, uh, let's try for a little more saturated, maybe a little darker. Let's see how that looks. I don't like that at all. Let's go with that. Let's make the bottom darker again. Uh, darker and more saturated. How does that look? Something like so. I don't want to spend too much time fussing with it. Um, but you can do a lot there with the sky. Uh, we can add clouds. If I, uh, I don't want to take that photo. Let me look to see what other images we have here. We could possibly steal some clouds or a, a smooth sky. Maybe we'll go with this image of New York City here and see if we can fuss with some of these clouds here. So let's go ahead and just grab a chunk of the sky here. 
uh, something like this. And I'm just going to control C to copy it, control V to paste it. Uh, we've got this bit of sky. And what we'll do is we'll move this into place. Something like so, and then command or control T. And I'm going to stretch it out like so. And let's go ahead and apply the same layer mask by just alter option dragging it up. Looks kind of cool. There's a little bit too much feather there on the edge. So I'm going to knock that back to yeah, about a six. And then if we do something like, let's try setting this to man, multiply, overlay. See, we're just kind of taking the texture of the clouds there. Um, and it does a lot to really change the look of the image um, underneath. So if I were to go to soft light, I would probably want to desaturate uh, my clouds image. So let me just bring this back to normal so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, we've got the clouds image. I'm not gonna go through any fancy methods of desaturating, just image adjustments, desaturate. And it's gonna get rid of that color. So we're just essentially using it as a texture over that blue background. And if we go soft light, I actually think overlay looks better. Hard light sometimes works really well with clouds. Uh, in this case, we would need to knock that opacity down uh, kind of substantially. Maybe something like that. Just adding some texture up in the sky uh, generally looks good. And then we could add a little bit of noise on top of it as well. Uh, noise always uh, is a nice little touch to add. Um, so with this, uh, we, we may want to do like a one last unifying. Can we add a little bit more blue to the foreground to help it match with the sky a little bit? So we can go curves again. Uh, whoever shouted out uh, using curves, here's another thing you can do with curves. Uh, with curves, not only do you have your RGB composite channel where you can adjust the overall tone and everything of your uh, image, but you have your individual color channels. So with blue, um, blue and yellow are opposites. So if you push up, right, if you click and add a point and push up, you're going to add blue to your image. And if you pull down, you're going to add yellow to your image. So just something to think about. We want to add a little bit of blue to the, the, the brighter parts of the image, but mainly we want to grab the, the blue that's affecting the black point of the image. And we want to just infuse and flood the darker tones of the image with more blue. All right. So something like that. It's extreme, I know, but we can always reduce the opacity. And it's always a little bit better, I find, to go overboard and then just dial it back a little bit. So um, in this case, I don't know that I want to dial it back. Um, I want to dial it back by first deleting that sky layer and then by adding another adjustment layer. And that's another color lookup table. And this is the very useful color lookup drop blues. So this is going to drop the blue tones almost entirely out of our image, as you would expect. Um, and in this case, it gives us a very desaturated image. Um, and all we're going to do is reduce the opacity, like knock it down to like 15 or 20%. So we're just going to just mute those blue tones in the image um, a bit, right? Okay, so we've, we've basically created our background. Um, if I wanted to take the time here, um, we only have about an hour left, so I want to move on to some other stuff. But like, it makes a world of difference if you go in and just use your healing brush and clean up like the spots on the, the ground and, and get rid of the oil stains and the crack in the asphalt. You, you take this scene and you sort of begin to make it look perfect. Um, in fact, if it bugs me too much later on, we probably will. And we'll clean up the wall, get rid of those like spackle marks or whatever that is. Uh, you can make the bushes all uniform and more poofy. Uh, maybe duplicate this bush and add another one right over here underneath this light or there's a hundred thousand different things you can do, but we're just building this scene out. That's what we're focused on right now. Uh, one thing I'm going to do here, I am going to downsize uh, this image because it's giant and uh, we want to make sure the stream is coming through as smooth as possible. So I'm going to hit OK just to speed up my computer on my end. I want to get rid of every bit of lag that I can. Uh, so we're going to downsize this. It's destructive, I know, but we're we're just having fun here. We're just playing. Everything Picasso did was destructive as well. He didn't even have an undo button, but he just had fun, I think at least. He does look miserable in a lot of his pictures, but I think he was having fun. Uh, let's go ahead and save this image as well. I'm going to drop it on the desktop, and I'm just going to call it, uh, let's call it day one. So I'm going to go day one. Voila. Okay, cool. And we're now ready to begin looking for a subject for this image. So uh, we got some stuff to choose from. We have, uh, we got this fella here. Uh, again, this is a photo that I shot. I'm trying to go with uh, photos that are outdoor. So you don't need a studio. Like we, I can just show you that this should work pretty well, even using photos that are just shot outdoors. Uh, but I think we have some stuff in studio as well, like this young lady. Actually, she's not studio. She's in front of a background. Um, a lot of different stuff we can do here. Let's go, let's just go with one of these shots. Maybe this one here. So DNG, 
uh, Adobe Digital Negative and uh, Windows 10, I guess, doesn't know what to do with it, but we're telling it and it's opening. All right, so here in Camera Raw, uh, you can see it's an old image shot with the Canon 5D Mark II. Uh, but old images work fine. And the, the Canon 5D Mark II is a uh, respectable camera. I'm going to go ahead and open this up in Photoshop. We're not going to do anything here in Camera Raw. There were a couple adjustments, the contrast and everything's like that, that were added or adjusted. But this is not at all how the final image is going to look. So we're not that concerned with it as long as the photo looks good and workable for us uh, in this instance. Uh, one of the first things that I like to do is to bring the, the uh, photo over into the working composite and you want to get an idea of, hey, is this photo going to work? Like, does the perspective line up? Um, is it even something where if I change the light and the color and the saturation and everything that needs to be changed, is it even going to work at all? So uh, let's try this here. I'm going to go model. I'm going to rename the layer that is, and I'm going to right click and I'm going to convert it to a smart object because smart objects are awesome. And uh, anything, frankly, that I can associate myself with that is smart, hopefully rubs off on me a little bit. All right. So we're going to just size this down. Nate, and... uh, Nate can I interject with a, with a question? Yes, of course. Um, this is a question from Christine. And, you know, I, I noticed looking at a lot of your photos, a lot of your photography has what I would call like a cinematic look to it. And as soon right. as I saw Christine's question, I realized that even though I thought that about your photos, I couldn't possibly answer her question, which is <laughs> how, 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 what makes a cinematic look? What makes a cinematic image? How would you define that? It, it, so it depends on who you talk to. Um, but one, it, there's a couple things. Um, number one is the shape of the light. So again, if I, I can, I can show you a good example of this. If we look at this photo here, right? This is very flat light, right? Relatively speaking, she's got some shadow, right? She's got, she's got a little bit of shadow here in the, I don't know what I just did. Uh, open up Outlook accidentally, hang our office. Uh, she's got a little bit of shadow right over here on this side of her face. Um, if I just go with a color that we can all see here. Uh, she's got she's got shadow over here on this side of her face, but really she's got very soft light that's just flooding in from this side. Um, and I know my arrow is giant, but uh, she's got a, a lot of light that's flooding in, but it's very soft. Like look at how soft the the fall off is of the light from this side of her face to the other, right? So it's it's not really the most cinematic light. When you flatten the light out too much, when you soften it too much, it can it can kill the cinematic vibe of the image. Now, the reason that this still feels cinematic is because they didn't kill off all of the shadow. And soft light, when you pair it with a good shadow, and when you shoot into the shadow side of uh, your subject, you can get really cinematic looking stuff. Um, so that's one element. Something else that's going to make this look fairly cinematic is the fact that it, there's a shallow depth of field. So you just, she's very cut off or popping off the background almost. It adds this sort of three dimensionality to it, um, makes it, makes the, the subject and the scene have this air of bigness. And when you pair a shallow depth of field with light that is um, shaped well, you get a really cinematic look. Another example would be that guy that we pulled up before, uh, this fella here. Uh, where again, you have just this, it's a shallow depth of field. Now this honestly feels maybe a little bit less cinematic just because there's not the same depth of field uh, situation that you have going on. And the fall off is so much more drastic. I would, I would classify an image like this more in the moody department and a little bit less of the cinematic department. Um, if you just start looking at, I mean, all the big films do it, um, where you have this very soft light but a, a shadow that's preserved and a, a shallow depth of field, um, it does everything. I mean, if we go to this shot, why does like great photo, awesome photo, it's sharp, it's well lit, it's everything, but it's not cinematic. It's more like a lifestyle, happy go lucky brandy type of image. Um, it's a great photo, but I would never say this is cinematic. Um, it's great light, it's flat light, right? Look at, look at, the difference between the light on this side of her face and the, the darkest shadow is there's not that much difference. Um, and also there's not as much depth in the image. So I think it's uh, the cinematic look that I'm always going for is something where you have 
uh, a good differentiation between your highlight and your shadow on the face, and uh, you are working at a shallower depth of field. But again, there's this added third idea of the motivating light in the scene. If you, if you were, if I were to take this photo of this, uh, this model right here, and if I were to light this shot, so instead of putting a light out here in the street and lighting her the way that the sun is already kind of naturally lighting her, if I were to take the light and put it over on this side, right, and have this big softbox filling all this in, it would just flatten everything out, right? It would, it would take the great, beautiful shadow that's there, that's giving the side of her face all this shape and totally get rid of it. And by the way, there's also, um, when it comes to shaping the light, shooting into the shadow side, like, so she's turning and looking up the road this way. Okay. The light is kind of almost hitting her from the back here. Right. And the camera is over here looking at the shadow side of her face. So when you shoot into the shadow side of somebody, I can give you a perfect example of this here on my mood board. Perfect example of this right here, right here this image let me zoom in and scooch down so right here with this guy when i photographed him i had him lit but you can very clearly see i'm pointing the camera right into the shadows right normally you think oh i want to put the light right in front of somebody i want to stand i want to have the sun coming right down and lighting their face beautifully and the intention is good but if you want a cinematic image you don't want to do that um, the, the mood is conveyed in the shadows, the, the mystery is in the shadows, the feeling is in the shadows, the, a lot of times the story of the image is in the shadows and the shadows are where you, uh, like your mind goes to play almost, right? You can see all that stuff in the highlights, but what's going on in those shadows, what's happening on this side of his face. And it would be a totally different image if I had gone to the other side of him and photographed the side of his face that the light was hitting, It'd be a totally different look. Um, and I'm sure I have some examples of that. Um, I mean, so, something even like this, where just the light was filling in the front of his face, right? The light is not necessarily what makes this look cinematic other than that, that edge light that's bringing in some shape. But here, this looks cinematic because we have beautiful soft light that's falling off. There's a little bit of light pulling him off the background. There's depth in the image, right? The light that was set up to light this scene is working with the the existing light sources. So my off camera flash is not clashing with the ambient light, but rather it's taking that ambient light. And if, if the ambient light is lighting like this portion of his face, and then it's kind of like this harsh shadow, I'm going to use my ambient light to try to smooth that transition of light. So that's exactly what we did with this guy is we just smooth the transition of light from the barber's lights up here, up on top of his mirror. And we just smooth the light across his face. And then the sun was setting, right? You can see the, the setting sun hitting this guy in the back of the head. So we just added a light that added this kick of orange, yellow light on the side of uh, this guy's face. So by doing that, by working with the light that's there in the scene, the ambient light, the, the, the motivation of the light is consistent. It's all moving in the same direction. Um, and then you throw onto that the shallower depth of field, and you're going to have images that look cinematic. Um, there's, a, there's a really famous... A cinematographer that everybody talks about. I forget the guy's name. I'm, I'm so pop culture illiterate. It's not even funny. Um, but there's a really famous cinematographer who uh, is just super well known for the style light. Um, you can look around if you're interested in, in incorporating something like this into your photography. Look for cinema and filmmaking tutorials on book lighting. Uh, book lighting or cove lighting. Uh, either, either are going to help you achieve this effect. Um, and it's exactly what I'm using to take an image and make it look more cinematic. Um, sometimes like with this backlit with the sun, you're just looking to throw some fill light in, right? And you're gonna let the sun do its magical thing and create this cool flare. But this image is very, very different than like this boxing photo that I've got here, right? But what do I have going on here? I've got, this is a much older photo. I wasn't quite as concerned with smoothing from the highlights to the shadows, right? But I still have that light coming in from a window uh, off camera left. Right? It's lighting up her glove. It's lighting up that side of her face. There's this practical light on the back wall there. So really, if I were to shoot this again, I would probably add an additional light just to give a real sharp sting of like orange yellow light right there on the, off the bandana and like above her eyebrow on that side of her head. And it would hit the back side of the glove and the punching bag. And it would it would really set this image apart. But also you got shallow depth of field again. So when I say shallow depth of field, I'm not saying take your lens and stop down to F2. 
uh, because then you're just going to get a lot of blurry photos. I'm talking use a 50 millimeter lens and shoot at f4.5, like 4.5 to 5, 5.6 5, even. That's a great aperture to work with. You don't want your background totally blown out. Like I like the fact that in this photo, I can I can almost kind of read what's on these posters. That like go in again, go look at like James Bond movies. Go look at any film that to you is a cinematic masterpiece or a big blockbuster that is well shot. And you're going to see these film principles apply in still photography as well. Every background is not blown out to the point where you can't make out the detail. Some of the most cinematic images you're ever going to see, the the subject is very clearly isolated from the background, um, but you can still see what's going on in the background. So that's important. So that that's one of the things that that makes my images. Uh, that's a, a number of the things that make my images uh, cinematic is the shaping of the light and the direction of the light. And you can see like the shot of this guy, the, the light's very flat. This is not like cinematic light, but we're going to go in and we're going to play with the light uh, here because we're in Photoshop and, and Photoshop lets you do stuff like that. I'm going to close this. Um, so one of the and things there, that- there are thank yous, by the way, from Christine and from Michelle and uh, uh, saying great description. So- Thank you. Cool. I'm glad. I'm glad. That makes me happy. Um, so with with an image like this, uh, one of the first things that I'll do, I just converted it to a smart object. So uh, just because smart objects are, are good, I will a lot of times just take the polygonal lasso tool and just do this really quick chop out and just look and try to envision how this is going to look. By the way, if you screw up with the uh, lasso tool and you click somewhere you don't want, hit the backspace key and it undoes the lasso tool one click. Just a nice little thing so you don't have to continually redraw all your selections. Uh, and then just come through here, uh, boom, and we're going to mask. So I'm going to hit mask and it's going to drop away the background, right? So what can, what can we see right away, right? I mean, obviously the color's off, the light's off, everything about it's off. It's not matching, um, but mainly the their perspective is off. Like really, it feels like he should almost be down around here. Now, this is a really tough image to line up perspective because we don't really have a great idea of the horizon uh, on either of these images. Now we can get the horizon much more easily on our background image. On the foreground image, uh, I broke, well, I didn't, yeah, I sort of did. I was shooting at probably at 200 millimeters and 200 millimeters at F4, you're gonna have this really blown out, you know, blurry background. But there was still just a stone wall with uh, sort of this grassy moss covering stuff on top of the stone wall. So I, I didn't have a good idea of where the horizon was. But if you know where the horizon is, you can really line up perspective well. And I'm going to show you another example here of just how effective this is. So we're going to take our photo of New York City. Is this the right shot of New York City? I think this is the right shot. Uh, and then we're going to take this balcony right here. We can actually use either picture of New York City. And with the balcony, uh, we want to very quickly just get rid of uh, the background. So I'm going to unlock the background layer and all this stuff in the sort of background of it. We're going to try to mask away. So I make a selection, hold down alter option and add a layer mask. And what that does is it takes the stuff in your selection and it hides that stuff, right? Instead of being the part that's saved. Uh, and then we'll just do a real quick, again, we're just doing a quick choppy edit here. Uh, just control I or command I on the Mac will just invert uh, that section of the mask. And remember the mask is black or the mask is white everywhere, excuse me. So if we control I, we flip it to black, therefore hiding that part of the image and giving us just a quick see-through. It's not perfect, but it'll be good enough to demonstrate this point. And this is gonna be a really, really important point here. Uh, that'll be really, really useful for a lot of your images uh, when, I, when I get to it here. There we go, did that. And then I would probably do something like just a quick, quick lasso here. Bing cross done up and over and then uh, we're going to fill this with black i'm not hitting control i because there's some black already there and we don't want to make a mess of that and then finally just get this last little bit last little bit here to make this look right or close to being right at least there we go Okay, cool. So the idea is we've got this balcony. Uh, we're paying a, a massive amount of money for this apartment. And we got this really cool view of New York City. So we're going to take New York City and drop it into here. Uh, I am going to close this image of New York City. And uh, how do we make this look right? Right? Like if New York City were here, 
right? And I made the image bigger. It's not going to look right. Like it looks kind of funky and weird. If New York City's here, it starts to look a little bit more right, but there's somewhere in here that's just right. And we will be able to find this by identifying roughly the horizon of both these images. Now you can be super precise and the more precise you are, the better your results will be. Or just for the sake of this example, we're gonna go kind of rough here. Uh, I'm gonna go with the line tool and I'm gonna give myself like a 15 pixel line, something that's really thick, uh, just creating a shape, that's fine. The line tool is located underneath the rectangle tool. And what I wanna do is I want to create a series of uh, lines, following leading lines out of my image. So this is a great image to do with because I got all these floor planks and these little sides of our, our little uh, balcony here. So I'm gonna create a line that follows this line right here along the bottom of the wall, right like that. Okay, so there's our first line. Uh, by the way, you could zoom in, uh, zoom in all you want. Let me bring the line up on top of our uh, image. That's great. Uh, and you can zoom in, but you really want to be able to drag the line way out there. All right. And then I'm going to create another line. And this one I'm going to take maybe from the top. You can take it from the top. You can take it from anywhere you want. So just like that. Cool. Uh, and you can, you can do a, a number of these lines if you like. Two a lot of times is enough. And you can see how these lines, by the way, if you hold down the space bar, you can move your line around before you commit to it. You can see how these lines all converge at almost the same point, right? They're all coming together, right? We're not doing this super duper in insanely precise, but we're pretty precise. And everything's kind of coming together right in this area. Well, what does that tell us? That's our vanishing point. And the vanishing point lives at the horizon. So if we come through here and I can get my line to go straight, like that would be our horizon. Now, normally I don't use the line tool to create the horizon. Instead, I hit Control R, that'd be Command R on the Mac, and click on the ruler and bring a guide down and set it right there at the horizon level. Uh, my guide is cyan colored, so it's difficult to see. Uh, and what we can do here, if I collapse properties, I can hide all four of these lines. And now we have our horizon. Well, what this means is if we can find the horizon in New York City image, which is you know roughly around the top of the buildings, it doesn't even matter how big or small our background is at that point, right? We can make the background tiny. We can make it huge. We can do whatever we want with it. As long as that horizon lines up with the horizon in our balcony image, it's going to look right, right? So like right there is about proper perspective and everything is going to line up pretty good because our background and our balcony both now have the same horizon. So it just looks like it should. And now it's a matter of then cleaning up the balcony and changing light or color or whatever, like whatever you would want to do. But the point stands that you have your horizon and it's, it, it looks right. So ideally you would do the same thing with an image like this, right? And you could draw your I have to interrupt lines. you again, just to say that's an awesome technique, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's super <laughs> duper helpful. It's you, you'll find it helpful if you're doing any kind of composite type stuff. Uh, and you could do the same thing here with this, right? Cause you got the, the line of the roof line and the sidewalk, you could draw them off and, and who knows the, 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 uh, vanishing point may be way out over here, but the point is it's going to give you a horizontal plane on which you can drag a guide and just be approximately correct. Again, the more precise you want to be, that's the beauty of it. You can be more and more precise and it's going to be better and better the more precise you are. But even a little imprecise is usually going to be better than just kind of guessing. That being said, we're going to guess with him because uh, that slips because uh, we don't have a horizon here for this image. Um, normally, like, what do they say? The horizon's around the shoulder. So uh, it's probably right around there is probably about right. All right. So I'm going to get rid of this mask and we're going to mask him inside of the smart object. So I'm going to, I can probably close this here because we don't need that open. Um, I'm going to double click here on the thumbnail to open up this image and we have him and using the power of Photoshop with these uh, selection tools, they've got this object selection, a quick selection, a magic wand, but uh, the select subject's pretty good. So we're going to go select subject. It'll probably do a decent job of picking him out. He is wearing a beige jacket or a beige background, uh, but you can see pretty remarkable job. Um, I find that it's best to just take a take a little look at your selection before you get into select the mask because I'm not the biggest fan of the actual selection features within select the mask. I do like the edge refinement tool. That's amazing and awesome. But like stuff like this, it's usually easier. I mean, even if it's just 
like taking the lasso tool and saying, hold down shift and just, you know, draw a little, little something there to just kind of touch that up and you hold down alter option and just knock out that little, that little edge there. That's going to be annoying us. And the same thing here, just drag in and get rid of that little corner and maybe hold down shift and add a little bit more of his jacket there. Something like that's good. You can look here along his head. Uh, up there along the hair, we can probably fuss with that a little bit. Again, you're asking Photoshop to do a lot when the color of the hair is this close to the color of the background, right? It's it, it, The engines can only do so much. We'll see what it can do. I don't have high hopes, um, but a lot of it will probably come down to just manual, you know, you and I being able to look at it and say, well, obviously the hairline's right there because we can see hair and not just, you know, pixels. So let's go ahead and just draw a rough selection here around his ear. And by the way, you can use whatever selection tool you want. I'm just, I don't even know why I'm using the lasso, to be honest. The lasso is like the caveman's tool of all the tools in Photoshop. So it's not the uh, not the flashiest, not the most robust, uh, but sometimes it just makes you feel like you're, you're putting in a good day's work. There we have it. And, you know, just it's just the little stuff, right? It's just these little, little things. Yep. And I want to undo that because I accidentally hit the Windows key and not the Alt key. There we go. All right. And now I can zoom out and we're going to get a, a pretty decent selection here uh, off of this. We will enter into select the mask. So with any of the selection tools, you're going to see the select the mask button pop up. Uh, normally right after select the subject, you would be able to say, hey, bring me in to select the mask. Great. And here he is over a darkened background. I like to do my selections usually over a darkened background. If you're in your image, uh, like if we were not working in the smart object and we were just over in our composite on layers is great because you can see exactly how it's going to look in your composite. Uh, but on black, uh, on white, also depending on the color of hair uh, or the color of your background or the color of the background that you cut the person or object off of uh, can be really useful. The on white, on black are just great for that. Um, and I'm just going to zoom in here and just take a little peek. Um, you can see here around the ears, not not the greatest um, but we can feather it a little tiny, tiny bit, and we'll add a little bit of contrast to kind of tighten that edge up a little bit. Um, and that'll also do uh, kind of do some favors for us around his uh, the edges of his jacket and things like that as well. The edges of the hair aren't great, but they actually may be, uh, may be passable. Uh, Photoshop waking out on me there when I, when I scroll. Uh, all right, let's uh, move down. And I typically like to output my selection to a layer mask. Um, I'm not gonna go with deca de decontaminate color. Uh, not in this case. Every once in a while, it's useful, but for us today, uh, I don't think we need to use it. So that'll probably work for us with a selection. Hit OK. And there we go. We have our model isolated on the background. Uh, Command or Control S to save it. Note, this is a .psb file because we're working in the smart object. We close this, and here we are back in our uh, little parking lot, hotel parking lot, motel parking lot, I guess. Uh, and now we have a, a couple different things that we want to do right off the bat. So before we begin looking at where's the light coming from, what do we need to consider in terms of like, maybe he should have some red and teal, uh, red and cyan lighting up the edges of his jacket. Yeah, we can do that. That's totally uh, fine. Uh, maybe this light here is going to be casting some light that will hit his jacket here. Maybe this light would be giving a little hot spot on his jacket there. And it's super dark in the foreground. So probably the bottom of his trench coat should be darker because we're going to have just darkness down there on the, the, the bottom of this image. Um, so uh, he definitely needs to be darkened. Um, so we have three initial things that I like to target uh, when I'm trying to blend an object or a person into a new scene. And that is, number one, the brightness and contrast. Number two is the level of saturation. And number three is the color tone. Um, and that's without even getting into like dodging and burning and changing the lighting uh, in terms of the direction of light and things like that. Uh, so if you isolate an image and get rid of the color, it's very easy to see he's, he's way too bright uh, for this image. So I have this black and white adjustment layer uh, and that's that's showing us very clearly he's way too bright. So let's try to tackle this first. He's too bright and probably kind of has a little bit too much contrast. And how do I know that? Well, usually what I'm trying to look at is the darkest parts of um, my subject or my model and the darkest parts of the background and their relationship with the brightest parts. There we go. Um, so he's just a little, you know, I don't know, the the 
I'm sorry, maybe the darker parts can go a little bit darker, but the brighter parts are too bright. So it probably means we'd end up reducing the contrast on him a little bit as well as brightness. So let's begin here with the curves adjustment layer. Uh, this is an area where curves just does this the best. You can, in theory, you can use levels, um, but it just, I've, it never comes out as good for me uh, when I'm using the levels adjustment layer. Uh, especially when compared with curves in, in a situation like this. So I'm going to use the hotkey control alt G that's command option G on the Mac. And what we're doing, if you look here in the layers panel, um, the, the adjustment layer is now clipped to just the model layer. So any adjustments we make to our curve are only going to affect the guy standing here and not our background. So let's begin by reducing the white point, right? Cause we know he's too bright and probably too much contrast. And maybe we can make the shadows a touch richer uh, and we can just darken, darken, darken. See, it's just too much, too much contrast. If we go too dark, just pulling down on the curve, I'm watching it darker. Now see like his hair, see how dark the shadow in his chin and his hair are compared with like the darkest parts of our sky. What that tells me is it's too dark. So we may need to just lift the blacks a little bit pull it darker, pull the scene darker, just until it kind of blends in a little bit more. Because if he's too bright in a scene like this, he's just going to look like he's glowing. And it's just a bad look. I don't know if you've seen a glowing person before. I haven't. Um, and it's just not the greatest. So now in terms of brightness, right, here's what we brought in. Here's what we have now. Um, the saturation is still way off. The color in general is way off. But um, we're heading in a much better direction with him being a lot darker and kind of matching the scene. If we turn on that black and white layer, it looks, he looks more in place, right? If you forget about saturation and color uh, for a moment, we may need to blur the background to give him a little bit of depth in terms of popping off the background and looking more realistic that way, but we have options. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, let's go ahead now and talk about saturation. He's way too saturated. I can just tell that right away, but how do we know what parts of him are too saturated? Uh, are there specific colors that are too saturated, right? Like maybe the blue of the tie is not too saturated, but the red and orange in his skin tone is way too saturated. I don't know. Let's find out. Here's how we're going to do this. We're going to create what's called a saturation mask. And we're going to do that with selective color. If you add a selective color adjustment layer, we're going to do the same thing here. Well, I'm sorry. We're not going to do the same thing. We don't need to clip this. This needs to affect the entire image. Uh, you have here all your different colors and then your three tonal uh, regions, if you will, blacks, neutrals, whites. Uh, we're going to begin with the reds and we're going to set black to negative 100. Oh, by the way, you want to, by default, this is set to relative. You want to set this to absolute. So we're going to go absolute and we're going to go to yellows. We're going to set blacks to negative 100. We're going to go to greens. We're going to set blacks to negative 100. We're going to go to cyans. We're going to set blacks to negative 100. Blue. You probably already know what we're going to do. And magenta, again, you probably know exactly what we're going to do. Now, for the tones, you want to boost black to positive 100. And neutrals. And then finally, blacks. And here we have what is called a saturation mask. And by the way, it's a lot of steps, so a little trick. If you hit the pop-out menu, you can save this as a preset. So we can save this as a preset. Oh, I'm sorry. You can, uh, da, 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 where is it here? There's a button somewhere. I'm forgetting how to do this. There's a way to save this as a preset. Um, well, there's a way to save it as a preset. I know that. I'll put it to you that way. Maybe you do have to just save it. I'm forgetting. I'm, I, I did this so long ago that I am forgetting how it worked. I'm just going to call it sat mask and I'm going to save it to my desktop because we're living on the edge. Okay. Yeah, there you go. That's what it is. And what'll happen is it's going to appear here in this preset drop down menu. So normally you would have your default that looks like this, but instead of going through all the sliders, just go saturation mask. Bing. There you go. It worked. It's the same thing with every image. So what we have here is the lighter any part of the image looks, the more saturated it is. The darker any part of the image looks, the less saturated it is. So what can we tell, right? Overall, our background is very desaturated. The only really saturated stuff is the bright red neon up on the roof, right? If we look in the background, that's the light stuff. Maybe a little bit of light reflecting on the, the soffit area here above the doors, but that's it. Everything else is relatively dark. So comparing that with him, he's much brighter. So we need to make him darker and look at his skin. His skin's really light and his tie is really light. So that, that those areas are really saturated. So there's a couple different ways you can go about um, attacking the saturation. 
I prefer to begin with a hue saturation adjustment layer. And uh, I prefer doing this because if I hold down Alt or Option, I can hover between the layers and I can clip this layer. Again, the hotkey, Control Alt G. And that's just gonna clip it to the stack. And now again, we're only affecting our model. And one of the things you can do is just click the little finger scrubby slider here, you see that? And now anything you click on in the image and drag to the left or the right, if you drag it to the left, it's going to reduce the saturation. But what it's doing is like, I'm clicking on his forehead. So hue saturation has said like, yeah, we're just gonna target these red and orange and kind of magenta tones, right? That's what these sliders are that appear. This is the tonal range or the color range, I should say, not really tonal, the color range that's being affected. So you can click and drag to the left and you can see how it's just making him darker, right? But look at how bright the tie still is because the blues, relatively speaking, are not being affected very much. Now we can go ahead and darken that jacket as well, right? So I can just go ahead. Yep, yeah, we're targeting these yellows and oranges. Let's darken that jacket down until it kind of looks like it's matching the scene around us. And then probably if we just go to blues and we desaturate them, we're going to watch that tie darken up quite a bit. And we want to we want to darken that way down, negative 90, negative 95, something like that. So now let's shut off our saturation mask and we can see there he is before and there he is with a saturation that is much more befitting the scene. He still looks off, however, because there's a lot of orange and yellow and warm tones with him, uh, whereas the scene behind him has a lot more blue uh, and blueiness going on. So how do we change that and work with that? Well, we come down here to our adjustment layers and we're gonna add a solid color fill layer. Uh, you can do that as well by going layer, new fill layer, solid color. And we'll just say, okay, and hit okay. And with this fill layer, we just want to fill it with a 50% gray. So I'm going to go to brightness here and go 50%. Great. And I'm going to drag this up to the top of my stack. We don't need to clip this. We're going to set this to the blend mode luminosity. And what this is going to do is it's really showing us the difference in um, kind of the minute color shades that we have going on in our scene and in the background compared with our foreground image. Uh, or, or our model in this case. And you can see that our model has got way more green, way more red, and way more yellow in him. The background's got a lot of magenta, pink, yellow, some, some red, orange, but really just because of the neon. We're not color matching to the neon. We're color matching to the, the average of kind of everything other than the neon, because that's the world that he's living in here. So we really need him to kind of match this parking lot color and the colors going on in the walls here. So we're going to try doing that. There's a Again, 50 different ways you can do this as well. You could use curves again. You wanted a new curves layer. You could go with color balance, something that's a little bit more intuitive. Uh, so we'll go color balance just to keep things mixed up here. And, you know, variety, as they say, is the uh, spice of life or something like that. Uh, I'm going to just uh, control alt G to clip that to my stack. So we're only affecting the model. And uh, you're going to see this begin to change here. So if I, I'm working in the midtones, if I go ahead and flood a bunch more yellow into him, you can see how much more yellow he becomes. Right. If I then pump a bunch of pink into him, well, look at how pink he becomes. So this should give you an idea of how this luminosity uh, color fill layer is telling us the difference between uh, the color that he has and the color of the background. If I shut it off, we can see he's very red and our color layer is telling us he's very red. So we're going to just zero these out again. And uh, we're going to begin trying to uh, get him a little bit more pink. So we're gonna go ahead and add a little bit of magenta, maybe a little bit of cyan in there, a little bit of blue. There we go. Let's go to the shadows here. Let's go push a little bit of cyan and blue into the shadows. See how he's slowly becoming more pink like the background. We need a little bit more cyan uh, to kind of match that background, but not too much. You can go overboard here and we'll go highlights. Highlights are still a little red red, yellow. So we're going to go with like some cyan and blue. By the way, you can see the opposite of these colors. Remember I told you before blue and yellow were opposites, right? Same thing with your, your RGB channels, red, green, blue. They correspond with cyan, magenta, yellow as in RGB and CMYK, K being black. Um, so red and cyan are opposites, green and magenta are opposites, blue and yellow are opposites. And it works the same when you're working with your curves. If you go into any of those color channels and you need to add uh, magenta, you're looking to pull down on the green channel, right? In those various areas of your histogram, if you need to add magenta to the shadows, you know, flood the shadows of magenta and so on and so forth. Um, all right, so we're kind of moving in a good direction here. Let's turn off our color fill. And you can see what we've got here in terms of his coloring. 
uh, it's beginning to fit a lot more with the image. Um, we still have some work to do in terms of making it look right, but you can see here's the, the shot we brought in and here's what we've done. And again, admittedly, it's a big difference. A daytime outdoor shot, not really lit in any specific direction. And we're going to this fake nighttime shot, which we've created. Um, it's going to be a bit of a, a little bit of a polarizing uh, result here. Uh, let's go back to the background layer. I'm going to unlock it. And we're going to add a little bit of blur here to this background layer. So I'm going to go filter. I'm going to choose blur gallery. And I think we're going to go with a little tilt shift action here. Um, what I want to do is I want to blur. I just want the foreground to be a little blurred. So I don't really want to do much in the way of the background. You know what, actually, no, we're not going to go tilt shift. We're going to do a field blur. Let's do a field blur. Nate, I'm going to interject with a couple questions from chat um, yes. here. Um, and uh, the the first is from Ferry, who asks um, asks if you have a favorite composite artist. Although I would broaden that question to just ask you um, about other photographers or other artists that you get inspiration from. Um, and then before you answer that, there's what I think is what feels like a related question from P. Sorry, P. Siller, um, <laughs> saying, "Where do you even?" Where does Nathaniel even learn these techniques? So we're learning from you. Uh, where do you learn from and where do you get your inspiration from? Um, so where do I learn from? I It's just like, a, a, you know, like I'm just like a little sponge with feet. You know what I mean? I just like you bump into stuff and you write it down. And I've got this stack of papers on my desk where I'm just like, I got to make a quick note. Let me explore that idea later on. And then also um, it's one thing to learn something. But when you're making videos about stuff, um, you really have to learn. It's like reading a book or reading a book out loud. If you read a book, the information comes in and hits your brain once. If you read a book out loud, the information comes in and then it goes out again. So it's like going over your brain twice. And it's, it kind of feels like that with teaching. So when I, when I find um, an idea or something that seems really cool or maybe could be useful, um, I try to make a video about it or I play with it and I really try to flesh it out if I'm not making a video on it as if I were making a video on it. So that really just helps kind of like sink it into your head instead of just being like, oh yeah, I saw this one time in this video and that was, you know, a year and a half ago and I totally forgot about it. Um, so that's it. And it's, it's just everything from you run into people. I mean, over the last year, we haven't really been running into much of anybody. Um, but you run into people and you see people doing stuff and you see videos online and you do these Adobe uh, live streams, you see people playing around with ideas. And sometimes it's, you know, I, I could, it could be something I saw in Adobe live stream where I see somebody start to do something. And I say, wait a minute, if I were to take that and use it this way, what would happen? And, you know, nine times out of 10, it's garbage. It, it's nothing. But every once in a while you run into something and you're like, whoa, this is, this could be useful. This could be neat. Um, and then you start playing with it and seeing if, you know, it's one thing to like play with Photoshop in a vacuum and be like, look at this feature that works so amazingly well. If I have the perfect stock photo and the perfect this and the perfect that, but it's another thing to like take photos that you're shooting or stock photos that don't really look like super duper professional photos and use these tools in Photoshop and make something using them. Uh, using the tools or the features or the techniques or whatever. Cause you know, it's, that's the cool thing. Photoshop is like math a little bit where you just, there's a billion different equations and you might discover the new theory of relativity, right? It's just, nobody has put together that list of tools or those blend modes or those uh, techniques and look at what it did in the end. Uh, so that, that's, that's kind of how my brain works with regard to this stuff. It's just see something cool, write it down, try to use it and figure out a way to teach it to other people because then it's like doing the pass through my brain on the insert, pass through my brain as I spit it back out. And then in terms of who my favorite uh, composite artists are, I don't know, I mean, I see a lot of great people. Um, uh, the thing about composite photography is the people that are really, really good at it, um, usually you, it's hard to tell that it's composite stuff, um, but and there's and also there's people who use it in photography where it's like partial composites right so what i mean by that is the best photographer in the philadelphia area that i know of is this guy justin james muir incredible work you want to talk about cinematic you want cinematic go look at this guy's work he is incredibly good at what he does 
Um, and one of the techniques that I know he uses is he'll take a photo of somebody um, and then he'll have like an assistant hold the light behind them in the photo and take another light to get the rim light that they want to match the scene that they're shooting. And then he just uses Photoshop to take that rim light that he took a photo of and just mask it into place. So you don't see the person standing behind him with the light, but you get this beautiful, perfect rim light that looks like, whoa, there should be a light behind this guy, but there's not. Well, there was, it's just he composited a little rim light on the head and the side and on the side of his briefcase or whatever that should be there to add this extra cinematic element. He'll do it where he'll shoot the room, uh, you know, spray a bunch of fog in behind the person and he'll photograph it. And, you know, it's just so it's, it's out of focus the way that it would be if it was, you know, eight and a half feet behind the person sitting at that bar stool or maybe bar table or whatever. Um, he does great work and his work is, not, I, I wouldn't really consider it compositing but it has lots of compositing that happens in it, but it's not pure composites where he's just building scenes and stuff like that. Um, and another guy who is really, really great is this guy, Eric Almas, who does incredible composites. You can tell that they're composites, but they're done really well. And they're just sublime. They're not, um, a lot of times what we have to do with our composites, and I'm the same way, because I'm not the most talented composite artist out there. You kind of have to like, throw a lot at the screen and mix it up and you know put it when you put enough sharpening and a little bit of clarity on top of it and add some noise it kind of is like okay passable all right through a through a little adjustment layer on top of it and tightened it all up we'll probably do some of that today and tomorrow um but the guys that are really good at it they can like it it almost doesn't look like like it it you can you know it's digital artwork because a train doesn't drive through the pages of a book but it, it looks so realistic that it's just incredible. That To make a composite not look like a composite is harder than making just a composite straight up. But those two guys are probably my favorites. But I mean, just in terms of pure Photoshop artists, there's like, there's incredible Photoshop artists who are just doing composites with like stock photography and game artwork and all kinds of stuff. Uh, all the time. I mean, it seems like every day and another kid or another somebody is picking up Photoshop and, and blowing out work that is just like, that's really good. <laughs> wish I was that good when I was, when I was that young. Um, anyway, so we're working with the field blur here. Uh, 15 pixels is too much for our blur. Um, I, I just want to go with something where like the ground behind him is being blurred a little bit. So I'm going to go with like a little six, drop it in here. If I hold down my alter option key and I click uh, to add another point, uh, let me just, maybe I, maybe I won't preview it here because the updating is taking a little bit of time here. The machine's processing a lot because I'm working with a big camera and I'm working with other stuff here, ladies and gents. I'm going to shut off preview for a second. Um, so I'm going to drag a point down over here. We're not really going to see what it's doing yet. If, if it allows me to drag a point, let me just, maybe I'll just click to add another point. It's, it's dancing around on me. Hang on. Bump, bump. There we go. Can I pull it down? You're going to let me. Try this again, but you know what? I'm going to cancel. I'm going to go back into field blur. Let's try this again. Filter, blur gallery, field blur from the get-go. All right, and we're going to shut off preview and try to work with this a little faster. All right, so we're going to drag this uh, point down here. Hopefully it'll, it'll stick. Uh, and then I'm going to come over here. I don't want this to be 15 pixels. I'm going to make it like seven maybe. So, you know, a, a much, much less of a blur. We're going to add a point over here as well. Uh, we're also going to make this seven. And what I was going to show you before is if you hold down, I believe it's alt uh, or option and you click, it'll save your seven pixel blur instead of resetting to the default 15. Um, so that's kind of nice just because, hey, less typing and stuff is always cool. So we've got our blur there, but really by the time we get back to the doors, I don't want it to be very blurry at all. So I'm going to try to add a point back here and I'm going to set this to like zero. Uh, and then we're going to add a point all the way back here. Uh, maybe I should set it to like two. I don't even know if these points are appearing, but let's just, uh, let's give this a shot here. I'm going to keep clicking. See, it's just jumping out here on me. Let me hit okay. Let's see what, it, you know, let's see what it looks like. Let's see what we've got here. Give it a second to render. And we've got the whole background just a little blurred, except for one area here, which is suspiciously unblurry. Uh, you know what? We're going to live with it. I don't mind the way it looks. I don't hate it. Um, now we got to work on lighting him. What are we doing time? All right. You got a couple minutes left here. Um, yeah, we've got about, we've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. So what I'm going to do is the first thing I'm going to do is darken the entire foreground a little bit. Um, and I'm going to do this, make sure black is set as my foreground color. 
and I'm going to add a gradient fill layer here. Now, by the way, I'm adding this gradient fill on top of everything else. In theory, we can get rid of our color fill, our selective color and black and white layers. We use those to just kind of hone him in and get him looking the way that he should. Let's do this quickly here. And I want to talk a little bit about some rim light. Uh, we're going to go gradient fill layer. We're going to say foreground transparent, which is what it's set to. That's great. Uh, it's up here under basics, bang, foreground to transparent. That's why I said we want our foreground color to be black. Uh, I'm going to drag this downward a little bit. You can just click and drag to get the um, to get the gradient to go down. But every time I click, it's going up. So let's let's cancel. Let's try doing this again. My computer's acting up, ladies and gents. All right, I'm going to hit OK. We're going to live with this. Maybe I'll drag it down a little, something like that. Uh, and then I'm going to try. What does this look like? A multiply. Nah, what does it look like? Soft light. Soft light. That's good. Way too dark. Again, it's just like we're adding stuff on top to cover up our mistakes. We don't want to do that. We want to be honest here. Uh, so we're going to go with like 50% opacity. And what this is doing is just pulling that foreground back kind of where it should be. Let's adjust the gradient here. Let's push the black down a little bit, right? I'm just going to push it down. We want it to definitely be kind of affecting the front of his jacket, maybe a little bit of the parking lot and um, not, not so much the, uh, the hotel. And now we're going to do some dodging and burning on him just to light up his face a little bit. So we're going to go ahead and add a curves adjustment layer. And I'm just going to try setting this to screen just like that. And we have our mask. We just hit control I, it's command I to flip it. And uh, let's bring our Wacom tablet back in here. I've got it set to wireless and it shuts off every, it feels like every two minutes because I'm constantly turning this thing on. And uh, let's zoom in here. Zoom in on his face a little because we're going to just, we're going to try to just add a little bit of light to his face and eyes maybe just so his head doesn't look like it's completely lost in the darkness up there. Uh, and then we'll play a little bit with some with some rim light. Uh, opacity of this, we're gonna set it to like 10%. So I just hit the number one, make the brush a little bit bigger. And then I'm gonna paint with white. So white is gonna reveal a little bit of light here. And we're just gonna paint over his face just a little bit. Again, we wanna smooth transition from the lights to the shadows and keep his hair looking dark because that looks better. All right, so something like that is good. Um, maybe what I'll do is just overall brighten his face a touch and maybe like this side of his jacket, just a little bit up here as though we're introducing light. We smooth out that shadowy part of his face a little, something like so, right? If I shut that off, there's what we had and there's what we have now, just lighting up that side of his face a little bit. Uh, and you can do the same thing to burn curves layer, but instead of setting it to screen, you would set it to multiply and then just fill your mask with black and paint with a 10% opacity brush. All right, so now, I think last... you must have really succeeded in creating a scene and a mood here and putting this guy in it because the whole chat conversation has moved over to like, who is this guy? What is he doing? Is he a spy? <laughs> is he what's with the trench coat? He's yeah. like, is this film noir? So yeah, he was, he was an interesting. Working. This guy was an interesting character. He was almost a wide receiver in the NFL. Um, Wow. Let's um, let's go ahead and uh, do one last thing here. And if we have a little bit of time, there'll be a second last thing, but I don't know what we'll the time for that. We're going to add some rim light here. We're going to add some red rim light as though the orange and red from this hotel is coming off and, and just dusting his shoulders a little bit. So we want to do this uh, in a way that we are clipping it to him because we just want the light on his shoulder. When you have a rim light, it usually it's just on your shoulder. And if we want it to kind of sparkle off his shoulder a little bit, that would be a separate technique, but you're not gonna have that type of effect. Like that's like a sun flare coming out around somebody where you sort of see the light sticking out past them. That's not gonna happen here because it's all coming from the neon at the, the pitch of the roof or the peak of the roof. We're gonna add a hue saturation adjustment layer here, and we're going to clip it to the layers below, Control Alt G. Again, this is just so it's affecting him. And you can see here now, if I change hue and saturation, it's going to do, I mean, it's doing, it's doing bad things to him. We don't want that. Uh, what we want to do, I'm going to pull the properties panel out again. We're going to colorize and we're going to go heavy on the saturation because, hey, we got some neon. It's looking good. Uh, I think we'll go like this kind of orangey red, maybe almost like a pink red color would be better, right? That's kind of what we got going on. Uh, let's go with something. Yeah, you know, what? go extreme. We can always dial it back with opacity. All right, great. And now with this hue, this hue saturation layer, double click on it, but not the word hue saturation, just the layer around the word hue saturation. And it's going to open our layer styles panel and not, not the gradient fill layer. We just want to open the layer styles panel and we want to use this blend if slider. So uh, basically the idea is we want there to be some natural blending that's going on here uh, with this where highlights, 
typically light highlights more than they light up shadows because shadows light sinks into shadows and it disappears. It's just sort of eaten by the darkness. So we're going to take underlying layer here and we're going to hold down the alter option key and click the slider to split it. And we're going to take that split slider and we're going to slide it back until we're kind of just getting this pink effect on the brighter parts of his jacket. See how it's kind of fading away from all the shadowy parts, right? You see what it's doing there? Right, so that's kind of cool. And then we'll do something like this color dodge work, linear dodge, is overlay better? Like what works the best for this? Maybe vivid light, that's kind of neat. Um, how does that compare with normal? I, I, th I think normal actually might be the best for us here. Um, and now that we're seeing this, we can say, maybe it's still a little bit too orange for us. So let's go more pink. So we can adjust the hue and our hue saturation, great. And then we're gonna take that mask and hit control I to just invert the mask. And now what we'll do is we'll begin just adding these little pink highlights uh, wherever we want them to be. So with your brush tool, uh, and again, this is probably something where I go with like a, I don't know, 60% opacity. It depends literally on every image. Uh, and you're gonna paint with white and you're gonna begin painting over different areas of him and just seeing how this pink affects the edge. And you can just, you know, blend it, just flipping back and forth black to white so you can paint these nice, these nice edges uh, so everything looks kind of natural, right? And we'll come across the top of his jacket here, add this pink light there, right? And then just, you know, flip back the black and just dust up the edges, make it look, make it look realistic like it should. Uh, and then we'll come down the jacket here, maybe make it a little bit bigger. That's going to give us an even softer transition. And by the way, you can see, I don't have to be very specific where I'm painting because this hue saturation layer is clipped to, uh, to him. It's clipped to the model. So yeah, I'm painting a lot out here over the hotel, but this is only applying this effect to him. So that's all we really have to worry about. And there's not gonna be too much pink down that that low, but you can see how we begin to get this effect where he's got this, uh, this pink color that's gonna begin wrapping in and around. And maybe I'll make it so it wraps even more, uh, just like so, even up onto the side of his face a little bit, right? Something like so. and part of the beauty of this is we can control this. Like there wouldn't be light here on the inside of his collar all the way down here, certainly not on his white shirt. There would be a little bit of light wrap, but not all the way down there. So that's great. Something like that. We could go around to the other side of the jacket. Um, you, can, you can really pick up anything you want. You come down here on his elbow. Maybe there'd be a little bit of pink there on the elbow, right? You can see how that just affects that part of the, the image. Maybe we could pretend like a little bit came through to one of the, oh, not that area. Uh, and then over here as well. So we would have a little bit of that pink going on down here, up over the shoulder, maybe the back of his, his jacket there and up on the ears like so. And you could also, by the way, do this with, um, with that cyan light as well. So I'm, not, I'm probably not gonna get to that here in this tutorial, but just like so that, just paint that off. We've got about two, anyway. three minutes left here. Okay, that's perfect. Uh, and then the pink is maybe a little strong and maybe the pink is too pink. So we go from the mask, by the way, you swap between mask and the adjustment with these two icons, back to the adjustment. We'll say, you know what, now I do wanna make this more red. I want this to be uh, less pink, more red because the, the, the neon up there is much more red like that. And then you can, of course, adjust opacity. So then just reduce the opacity just a touch and you have something like this where, again, this, this process, this is where we could spend the hour and a half just doing all the rim lighting and stuff, but this is where adding this little bit of light to the side of his head and really blending it well into the jacket here, uh, you, total game changer. I mean, it will really change the way this looks and really you'll begin to look at him and say, yeah, he totally belongs there in that image. Uh, that's exactly where he should be. And since we still have about a minute, Let's do one last thing here. Uh, let's add a fog is always cool, right? So let's add a little bit of fog here behind him just to add some misty mood. And this will have to be dropped in behind him. And we set this to the blend mode screen and we probably wanna flatten it out a little bit. Commander control T to bring up free transform, right click and we're gonna go distort and we're gonna bring this a mist over oh, this way, something like this. Keep it, keep it lower against the ground something like that. Oh, what are we doing here? This is meant to go this way, guys. All right, something like that. Let's just keep that. And then you could add your layer mask and with a massive soft brush, paint with black and just dust away the bits that you don't want in terms of the, the sort of smokiness. 
Um, and then probably even a little, uh, well, we already set it to screen. What am I thinking? Just a little opacity adjustment, something like that uh, will do us a lot of good. And, um, you know, pop it up to a new layer and I'll do what I said I wouldn't do before. And that's pop out to the camera raw editor, control shift A. And we'll just add a little bit of clarity here because clarity always looks cool and adds this neat element to your photos. So there you have it. There's the clarity and I can go to full screen and we can just examine this in greater detail. Uh, but you can see uh, we just we made the night scene. We added layer with our, our lights in the background. All of that just adds this depth and this mood to the image. Uh, we changed the color of him. He's probably a little bit too purple if you're looking at it, but this is part of what you do. You put together your initial view and then you look at it and maybe you go and you get yourself some coffee or whatever your preferred beverage is. And then you come back 30 minutes later and you say, yeah, there's too much blue in his face, right? His skin would look a lot better if I warmed it up a little bit. And then you can do that. Maybe the white wall needs to be a little bit less white back there. It's a little distracting. It's too bright for this particular look. Okay, fine. We can do that. Let's add some stars to this guy. Done. You can do that. So a lot of different things that can be done. Um, yep. And, and, uh, and, and that's how we do it. So hey, this has been, you. this has been so fantastic. Um, so let me say really quickly, uh, everybody who's watching, stick around uh, to catch graphic designer Shanti Sparrow at 12 p.m. Pacific. And you can follow along as she shows you how to create packaging design for a fictional ice cream company meltdown moment. Um, Nate and I will be back tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time for part two of this. Do you want to take like 15 seconds to say a couple words about what you'll be covering tomorrow, Nate? Yeah, we're just going to be doing more of the same. Um, not this same composite, but we're going to be doing more retouching. We'll probably be working more on skin and light and, and just everything that goes into making this stuff happen. This has been really fantastic. I have learned a ton. Thank you so much for being with us today, Nate. I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined us on the live stream today. Have a great Thanks, day. guys. Thank you.